Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn to proud music of the storm and we turn now to sections two through six. And as we turn, we've already commented on uh, the first section of this poem. I just want to pause for a moment and I want to place our entire study of Leaves of Grass, uh, the deathbed edition, now in a certain kind of context. You could, and I think we've been trying to make this argument in some ways, but now we'll just go ahead and say it directly. You could make the argument that Leaves of Grass in many ways is Whitman's attempt to try to speak to a broken or near broken America through the metaphor of music. The argument being that music is the best way to understand disharmony and harmony. And the way in which Whitman will play this game, I find fascinating through wordplay. For example, notice how he loves to use words that can be both used as nouns as well as verbs. I mean, think about storm as a word that can be used as a noun, obviously. Um, that is to say, proud music of the storm. Or it can also be read as a verb. I mean, just think about the power of the word leaves as in leaves of grass. I think it's Whitman who teaches us that, for example, school is both a noun and a verb. Obviously, we've played that game as well in passage 48 of Song of Myself, that God is both a noun and a verb. Obviously, love is a noun and a verb. That is to say, I think Whitman is trying to do something profound. And in this poem, I think in many ways, he's bringing us back to what is at the very heart of leaves of grass. I've been making the argument that of all times in American history, now is the time to be reading Whitman more than ever. Why? Well, because Whitman lived through the most dysfunctional time in the history of America. I mean, think about it. For those four years, he was front and center, right in the very middle of the worst imaginable kind of situation, the, mo the worst imaginable dysfunctional uh, situation. And he saw the family as being dysfunctional. And yet, at the same time, he had this, as we called him an informed optimist, he had this unbelievable optimism that things can get better. And what was his motif? Well, it's, it's going to take us all the way back to the opening lines of the great epic poems. Real, you'll remember it. In all three of the great epic poems, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, we've given full lectures at LearnStrunk.net. Think about it. What word is it that's there in the very first line? Well, it is the word sing. That is to say, Whitman takes us back to the idea of singing and song. What's his most important poem in Leaves of Grass? Song of Myself. So that I think that when we look now at passages 2 through 6 of this amazing poem, we're going to understand that in some ways it is his attempt to invoke the muse. And in fact, we're going to play that game actually later in the poem, where he actually invokes the muse. Playing in the Homeric tradition, I don't think there's a poet, other than maybe Emily Dickinson and Plato, who have taught us so much about wordplay and the power of music. You'll remember in our comments on Plato at LearnStrong.net that Plato was heavily influenced by Pythagoras and the notion of harmonics as being foundational to his understanding of political harmony. Now our assumptions are that you've been following us at LearnStrong.net down that left-hand side talks with Walt, our playlist, and that from the very first introductory word song, uh, um, come, we have been playing around with singing and with songs and with chanting and with embracing as well uh, as all the other kinds of motifs. And we've given a set of introductory comments to, uh, uh, to uh, this poem, and as well, we worked with passage number one. Now, we pointed out in that earlier lecture that you can see this poem in three parts. Part one is section one, part two is sections two through five, and then the culminating part in, in section six. So as we turn, we'll play this game now deliberately. Now, just as we said in our last lecture, I wish that I could uh, read this entire poem all the way through and then come back to exegete. We just don't have enough time to do it. And Norton's, our, our go-to reference for any kind of footnoting, will give us a lot of references in the next few lines. And so we'll be bouncing back and forth between the poem and what Norton's has to say. And I intentionally mentioned the very first word of the deathbed edition is the word come, because look at the first word of part two of Proud Music of the Storm. Come forward, O oh, my soul. You'll, you'll remember this, O oh, my soul, construction in a song of myself, 25, as well as Song of Joys. And let the rest retire. Listen. And of course, think about how many times we've heard that word in Leaves of Grass. Lose not. It is toward thee they tend, parting the midnight, entering my slumber chamber. You'll remember this from the last line of part one. 
For thee they sing and dance, O soul. Now, the storm that Whitman is actually talking about in this poem is not a storm as you would normally think of it, but more like an attack on the musical senses in his dream state. It's compelling, of course, that we will leave this poem to move to Passage to India, and then a few moments after that, we'll meet his great poem, The Sleepers. So we're playing with all kinds of dream motifs as it, as it relates to this. Notice what we get. A festival song. The duet of the bridegroom and the bride, a marriage march with lips of love. Um, you'll remember it's Song of Myself, Seven Lips That Have Smiled. With lips of love and hearts of lovers filled to the brim with love. The red flushed cheeks and perfumes. The cortege swarming full of friendly faces, young and old, to flutes, clearest notes, and sounding harps cantable. Now our Nortons will tell us that uh, this cantable here is music and song-like style appropriate to uh, the wedding procession. Um, now, he'll use this word several times in this poem now, now loud approaching drums. In other words, it's almost as if Whitman wants us to step onto uh, the stage of his mind in his dream state, and now one thing after another, there's a lot of Shakespeare happening I think in this poem as well, uh, one thing after another will now come onto the stage, now um, loud approaching drums. And, and the moment we think of drums and hear drums, we obviously think of drum taps. Uh, Victoria, and then exclamation point. You'll see several of these in the poem. Seest thou in powder smoke, the banners torn but flying, the rout of the baffled, hearest those shouts of a conquering army, ah, soul, the sobs of women, the wounded groaning in agony, the hiss and crackle of flames, the blackened ruins, the embers of cities, the dirge and desolation of mankind. I've, I've had uh, conversations with some who argue, I just can't read Whitman because he's just too idealistic. He's just too optimistic. And I'm like, I don't know that you've actually read Whitman if that's your view. Because notice the, poem, the, the lines that I just read and the horror tragedy of what he calls music. In other words, as we say, an informed optimist, Whitman is acutely aware there is the other side of the yin yang symbol. That is to say, yes, there is light, but there's also dark. Yes, there is joy, but there's also sadness. There is pain, and we'll play it out here. Now, our Nortons will tell us about this Victoria, that it's England's queen. This, perhaps, Norton says, is a reference to the Crimean War and the charge of the Light Brigade, October 24, uh, 25th, 1854. Perhaps a taunting reference to the triumphant Northern armies of 1865 in the light of British neutrality. It's, it's interesting, it's hard to know exactly what he means. Notice though, we've got the rout of the baffled, makes us think of course of Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade, that poem of 9 December 1854, we've given a full lecture at learnstrong.net. The, uh, the shouts of conquering army obviously takes us to Emily Dickinson's successes counted sweetest and those finest lines there, final lines there. Um, we've as well talked about that at learnstrong.net. And then it's in parenthetics, Almost as if he's channeling Emily Dickinson, the sobs of women. He sees this as, again, music. Uh, again, he heard, as we've commented so many times when we did drum taps, as the nurse. He heard the wounded groaning in agony. By the way, groaning is used one time in All Leaves of Grass. It's right here. I sit and look out. You'll remember his use of the word agony. The hiss and crackle will take us, obviously, back to drum taps. The blackened ruins, the embers of cities, the dirge and desolation. By the way, the only use of desolation in All Leaves of Grass is right here, right now. Of mankind in parenthetic. And then we're back now to the now. Now airs antique and medieval filming. So in other words, now we're moving on. It's, there, there's a great amount of influence, I think, of photography, the early art that was just beginning, and the idea of the early motion picture idea, where you could sit and just watch things happening across the landscape of stage or film, and that's where we're playing. You'll see the repetition now of I. I see and hear old harpers with her harps at Welsh festivals. By the way, notice how he'll just go all over the world. Welsh festivals, I hear the uh, menace singers singing their lays of love. These, uh, these menace singers are the old, uh, are the old chants, um, you'll remember. I hear the minstrels, gleeman, troubadours of the Middle Ages. And, and I think what Whitman is trying to do is to bring together the entire panoply of the history of music and call it the history of humanity. And there's many who have made this argument. Right, from in our evolutionary history, from the very beginning, it had to have been rhythm that probably brought us together in some kind of harmony. Now, at this point, with the next, uh, with the next phase, um, we're told by, uh, by Norton's that the symbolism in the next lines is interesting. That the bass, as in B-A-S-S, -S, notes, 
of a musical phrase represent the maternal basic instinct of the whole harmony of creation. I find this, I find this remarkable. Now the great organ sounds. Tremulous, while underneath. You, you remember when we commented in our lectures on uh, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost? That, that reading Paradise Lost out loud, which we love to do, obviously, in 303, uh, th there's that sense of you have like organ play, where you have notes and then you have subnotes, and that's the stuff that's happening with the feet. And I think here he's playing a similar kind of game. While underneath, as the hid footholds of the earth on which arising rest and leaping forth depend, all shapes of beauty, grace, and strength, all hues we know. Green blades of grass, and again, I think he's smiling all the way through leaves of grass as he writes some of these lines. And warbling birds, we've heard warbling a number of times. Children that gamble, you'll remember this from Song of Myself 24, and play the clouds of heaven above. I love it that in a poem on music that he mentions the play of children as being the music as well that he loves. The strong bass sounds and its pulsations intermits not bathing, supporting, merging all the rest, maternity of all the rest. Again, Whitman's love of the maternal is, I think, compelling. And with it, every instrument in multitudes, again, he loves that word, huh? The solemn hymns and masses rousing adoration, all, notice his use of the word all through this poem, all passionate heart chants, sorrowful appeals, the measureless, we've heard this, of course, and cannot be measured in Song of Myself 46, sweet vocalists of ages, we've commented already on his love of opera, and we'll get to it again later, and for their solvent settings, earth's own uh, diapation, and, and, we, and we saw this, uh, this diapation uh, word um, earlier, that, that is to say that burst of harmony, right? Of winds and woods and mighty ocean waves, a new composite orchestra, binder of years and climes, tenfold renewer, which is why we say for Whitman, the new is the new, the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W, as of the far back days the poets tell. And then he mentions the Paradiso, um, Norton's will tell us, we, we know this, of course, because we've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net over all Divine Comedy, the third part, of course, of Dante's Divine Comedia, in which the great Italian poet and his Beatrice together ascend to their sphere in heaven, the wandering dun of line 49, obviously, right? Um, the, uh, he, he, says, he says it this way, as of the far back days poets tell, the Paradiso, the straying fence, the separation long, but now the wandering done, I mean obviously this is our this is our Ithaca return to Ithaca as well as our Dante. The journey done, the journeyman come home, the and man and art with nature fused again. I told you about hugging and grabbing and clasping, now it's fusing. Then he uses the word tutti, uh, which is literally all entire, it's a command of the instruments all together as signaled by the orchestra leader, this is again Norton's, of line 53 after the straying from the Paradiso and the journey home again, duty for earth and heaven, and then again in parenthetics, the almighty notice capitalized, by the way, only use in all of Leaves of Grass is that, uh, that word is right here, the almighty leader now for once has signaled with his wand, in quote. And uh, back to my opening comments of this lecture, I think that when you look at Whitman, he is tapping more into the Dionysian strain than he is into the Apollonian strain, to borrow, of course, from that famous Nietzsche lecture of which we've commented as well at Learnstrom. The idea is that when you look at some, a writer like Emerson, who I think we're supposed to think about another set of lines like this, Emerson is more tapped in, of course, to the Apollonian, which is why we celebrate his essays far more than his poetry. We've given, obviously, lectures all, uh, on almost all of, uh, Emerson's essays. But here, notice, it's that idea that song, chanting, the music of poetry is what brings us all together, and that in the end is the Almighty, that is to say God, that is to say love, however you wish to think of it. And then it's the manly strophe of the husbands of the world and all the wives responding. Strophes um, will get used in passage six here in a little bit. Uh, strophes, uh, Norton's, Norton's will tell us uh, that the, that strophe is now usually stands of it here as in the Greek choral dance, one in a succession of corresponding movements. And it's no question to me that Whitman is playing around first with the Greek tradition and then obviously he'll bring us to the Renaissance tradition. Um, I, I, uh, I'd like to as well point out that Tutti um, was, is, will be used later, that music uh, are always around me uh, in Whispers of Heavenly Death. We'll hear it one more time. He continues, the tongues of violence, I mean, what a great, what a great way to say it. The tongues of violence, then again, parenthetics. I think, O oh, tongues, ye tell this heart that cannot tell itself, this brooding, yearning heart 
that cannot tell itself. We've used this term from uh, Wilberian integral philosophy, translinguistic, the inability to say in words what can be said in music. From here now we move to part three. Ah, we've seen that construction. Ah, from a little child, thou knowest so how to me all sounds became music. My mother's voice in lullaby or hymn, the voice, oh tender voices, memories, loving voices, last miracle of all, oh dearest mothers, sisters, voices. Now I just want to pause for a moment. Think about the opening lines of James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and how it begins with song. And I think, I think Joyce was influenced by ideas like this, that from the very beginning we were influenced by music. Uh, music is who we are in some fundamental way. Of course there was a child went forth comes to mind here, no question. And you'll remember this idea of my mother's uh, voice in The Singer in the Prison, another beautiful representation of the power of music. Notice he calls it the, the tender voice of a mother, the last miracle of all. Then from the mother's voice, he goes to the rain, the growing corn, the breeze among the long-leaved corn. I, I told you about his use of the word leaves and leaves of grass. The measured sea surf beating on the sand, the twittering bird, the hawk sharp scream, obviously we think of Song of Myself 52 and the barbaric yacht. The wild foal's notes at night is flying low, migrating north or south. The psalm in the country church or amid the clustering trees, the open air camp meeting, something that Whitman's um, uh, readers would know all too well. The fiddler in the cabin, the glee, um, you'll remember glee from Song of Myself 10, amazed at my own glee. The long strung sailor song, the lowing cattle, bleeping sheep, the crowing cock at dawn. By the way, notice your trinities in these lists. All. And now he's back to the word all again. All songs of current lands come sounding round me. And now all of a sudden we're going to get to the international grouping, right? Um, and, uh, and, and the game that gets played here that will remind us of Song of the Answer or One all of a sudden. The German airs, that'll be, uh, that'll be mentioned for the first time in Song of the Answer. Of friendship, wine and love, Irish ballads, merry jigs and dances, English warbles. Chansons of France, Scotch tunes, and or the rest, Italia's peerless compositions. Our, uh, our Nortons here will tell us that the opera in which Whitman's interest was in inexhaustible, as we've said. We're going to meet Norma, the heroine of Bellini's opera of the same name. Um, you'll re be reminded of the Italian music in Dakota. Norma brandishing her dagger against her lover and is enacting the climactic scene of the opera. We're going to get Lucia, the heroine of Donizetti's opera, um, tricked into marriage with a man who, doesn't, who she doesn't love. Lucia obviously murders him and then collapses into madness. Ar Arnini, uh, the hero of Gespusi Verdi's opera of the same name, his secret, uh, the uh, Ar Arnini's secret adoration of a court lady betrothed to a Spanish grande leads him into a typical complex love intrigue ending in his tragic suicide. And then we're going to get a reference to the great troubadour duet in Bellini's opera. Um, and then Fernando, the hero of Donizetti's opera, um, and the description of one of the poet's most loved scenes in which Fernando, in his despair, believing his beloved Lornaire, has, been, has deceived him by becoming the king's mentress. We're going to get uh, uh, Amina, the soprano role in Bellini's uh, uh, Salamna, uh, Sambula, um, the, uh, the Italian music in, in Dakota poem. We'll come back. All of these references for us will now come one right after the other. Notice how he plays the game. He says it this way. Across the stage, with pallor on her face, yet lurid passion stalks Norma brandishing the dagger in her hand. I see poor crazed Lucia's eyes, unnatural gleam, her hair down, her back falls loose and disheveled. I see where Arnini walking the bridal uh, garden amid the secret, uh, the scent of night roses, radiant, holding his bride by the hand. Here's the infernal call, the death pledge of the whore. So, uh, to crossing swords and gray hairs bare to heaven, the clear electric bass and baritone of the world, the trombone duo Libertad Forever, from Spanish chestnut trees dense shade, by old and heavy convent walls a wailing sound, song of lost love, the touch of youth and life quenched in despair, song of the dying swan, Fernando's heart is breaking, awaking from her woes, at last retrieved, Amini sings copious of stars and glad, as morning light, the torrents of her joy, remember glee from before of now glad. The teeming lady comes, the lustrous orb, Venus Contralto, the blooming mother, sister of loftiest gods, Alboni's self, I hear. 
For uh, Lustrous, by the way, um, uh, Norton's will say, in its first appearance in the Atlantic Monthly of February 1869, this word was lustrous. If lustrous is in fact a typographical error, it persisted through nine uh, um, leaves of grass issues during Whitman's lifetime to become lustrous once in uh, in one of those, and then afterwards uh, changed. It's it's an interesting study in itself. And of course, Alboni is the great operatic uh, prima donna introduced to New York during the summer of 1852. We said in earlier lectures to a certain contratechi that he attended all her performances and regarded her as singing as the most moving of his musical experiences. Now we move to passage four, and we're going to get to this to the symphonies and the operas. Here we're going to hear about William Tell, of course, uh, Rossini's famous opera from the Swiss Hero, first produced in 1829. Meyerbeer uh, produced his romantic operas uh, in Paris in 1831, 36, and 49, respectively, of the of the titles. Um, um, Gounod's um, uh, Faust is an opera based upon Gounod's great poem. We've given full lectures on that, produced in Paris in 18. Uh, 59. We'll have Elysius, the great Grecian city northwest of Athens that will be mentioned, and then Circe's in Roman mythology, the goddess of the harvest. So we're going to now play that game. We're going to get ten eyes in a row now. Watch this in passage four. I hear those odes, symphonies, operas. I hear in the William Tell the music of an aroused and angry people. I hear Maybar's the Huguenots, the prophet, or Robert, uh, Godot's Fa uh, Faust, or Mozart's, M Mozart's Don Juan. I hear the dance music of all nations. Now we're going to dances. The waltz, some delicious measure, lapsing, bathing me in bliss. Again, it was glee before. The bolero to the tinging, uh, tinkling guitars and clattering castanets. By the way, you'll, you'll remember this word bliss that he uses in I 